Um, hello, you had your break, the opportunity to get away. You had your great talk, so here's the rest. Um, so I, I want to introduce Bayesian networks. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in that, so that's a bummer. And um, it's more like a learning experience I'm going through now, so bear with me. Um, first, for someone who would be even less educated than I am, so like a chair, uh, I introduce Bayesian probability um, a little bit, then the general idea of the Bayesian networks, and in the end we'll see a very underwhelming uh, demo on the Kaggle data. So, uh, what's Bayesian probability? Um, geeks amongst you, which means all of you I expect, uh, know XKCD, so here's the Bayes theorem with a very important new member, the probability that you're using Bayesian statistics correctly. Um, in general, we have uh, two interpretations um, of probability theories. We can have the frequentist one, so that's basically just trying to run the experiments as often as we can, repeat them, and then take down those notes. That's when you're throwing the coins and then you find out that your coin is biased because like you threw 60 times uh, heads and one times uh, whatever the other thing is, tails. And so, um, that's one approach. The other approach is you're actually not trying to um, measure the uh, repeated um, procedure, but you're trying to work with your level of certainty, how you view the problem itself. So you have a prior, in the case of a coin, you would expect that the coin is fair, and then you try throwing around the coin, and the more heads you get, the more suspicious you get about the coin. And um, as far as I know, historically, you, you get some problems with these interpretations. Historically, supposedly, first Bayesian was more prevalent than the frequentist now basically rules science and uses p-values and similar magic. And, um, but one of the problems with Bayesian statistics or um, probabilities is that uh, it, it's quite computationally demanding. So doing it on paper, on by hand, uh, no one would bother that much. And also it sounds really suspicious, especially in the context of any um, scientific endeavor to speak about like your certainty and expectations and similar stuff. So just to summarize them in a shorter fashion, you basically, in one case, you make the maximum of your observations, how many throws, through, uh, throws I have that I judge upon. In the other, I make up a prior, some expectation, and then I try to work with that. Um, the Bayesian formulae has different parts which are quite integral to the understanding. So what we're trying to figure out is uh, for a hypothesis H, how probable that hypothesis is given the data, which basically the data is that coin tosses and stuff. So you can kind of hide frequentist probability into bias. So yay, bias is better. <coughs> and um, so we have, uh, this is calculated from either the support for the hypothesis H, which is the whole big bracket there, which is composed of the data, the probability of the data with the supposition of the hypothesis and of the general observation likelihood of the data itself I have. And then my prior um, probability of the hypothesis. How much do I trust the fact that it's an alien? How much do I trust that the coin is fair? And so on. So in our case, for example, we could have the hypothesis that the audience understands the lecture, which I would say um, in this context will be very high. And we can suppose that the data which could demonstrate this uh, probability it could be the uh, observed um, frequency, so we can use the frequentist view of the audience's questions. Um, measuring quality would be more difficult, so you know, make it always easier. And um, so we can then translate these um, a little bit cryptic um, uh, formally into the sentence that Px is the probability of getting any questions, while Px um, separator h is the probability of getting questions 
given the audience actually understands what I'm talking about. Now, you might notice in this context, for example, that the confusion of the audience might stem from different causes. It might stem from the fact that I'm talking gibberish. Or it might stem from the, con from the fact that they actually understand what I'm supposed to talk about, and that's why they're confused and ask the questions. So there can be multiple causes, and we'll get to that a little bit. Um, let me quote someone. If we quote someone, you seem more um, educated. So uh, Yudkowsky, that's the all, um, founder of Less Wrong, if any one of you knows. And he said that bias is cool. So who would doubt that? And the general way how you can then walk in bias as opposed to the frequentist approach where you just have to throw more coins and then get your distribution. In bias you can make uh, some, based on some prior knowledge which might be totally ignorant as my is about Bayesian uh, probability, make some prediction from that and then collect some data, the questions from the audience for example, predict, uh, correct my prediction a little bit, update my knowledge and create a new uh, prior. So it allows me to learn, which is cool because that's what we usually here do with machines. I hope. No one is doing weird stuff. So um, how to get Bayesian networks? We have a joint probability distribution, which is basically just a probability distribution. Um, I use again weird letters which tell nothing because the funny examples come afterwards. So uh, I have um, two binary variables a and b and the probability of them both being zero is 0 0.2 and so on and then i have a directed acyclic graph so basically it's a graph which is which has directions on the arrows and there's no cycles in that for anyone who sees a dag for the first time and you know as the song goes i have a dag i have a gpd then I have a bias in probability uh, network. And in the case of um, why this joint probability distribution is useful is that um, you can calculate if PowerPoint doesn't mess up your um, formulae, you can calculate the probability of different conditional probabilities um, of those variables. So that leads to those bias in networks in this fancy case. So here I have the probability of some variable A. There I have a, the probability of some variable B, which is like just 50-50. And then I have the interesting case of the variable C, whatever that is. And that variable depends, I assume, on the two independent variables A, B. And then I have uh, another variable D, which is dependent on variable C. So um, what you can notice in this slide is that on, in this case, when I assume the conditional um, dependence of the uh, variable C on the variables A and B, I get a big table. In the case of A and B, I get a really small table. Hmm. Small tables, in this case, smaller is better. Because then I can better understand, better read what's happening with probabilities. So adding the DAG to the joint probability distribution doesn't just make some fancy tables and graphs, but it actually helps me in readability. So that's one of the reasons why the Bashi network becomes a very interesting tool, because you can now create a graph with these partial local prob um, conditional probabilities. And what's even cooler, if you assume that those connections are uh, factual or correct, you can then calculate all the conditional probabilities between those nodes. So instead of having one really huge table where on many places on, uh, on um, you'll have the same conditional probability because if something is independent, then the probability of uh, uh, it being conditioned on something from which it is independent would be the same as if you, if you don't put it there. Then instead of having this really big confusing table, you can have a reasonably nice graph. Reasonably nice unless you start to deal with bigger problems, obviously. Uh, for example, even adding a few nodes, we get a more complex graph, but thanks 
to science, we have a um, uh, procedure how to determine what that graph actually tells us. Because in the previous case, we saw we had just like two nodes connected to one, so that was easy to determine who's independent from whom, because yeah, they are totally not connected. Cool. But in this case, what are the relations? Is, um, for example, A and D, are they independent if I still have some kind of path amongst them and so on? So what you do is you're looking for the um, D separation of those different nodes. And in layman words, which I understand, uh, you can take it like that. If I have a starting node or starting nodes and a terminal node or terminal nodes, then those are independent if the path between them is blocked in some way. The blockage is determined by two possible conditions. So either the blockers are, um, obviously I, I didn't want to add more confusion by using B as the abbreviation for blockers because that would even be more unwieldy um, letters in the text. But uh, the blockers Z, they block if either they don't have any converging arrows along the path between the two nodes or regions I'm interested in, and they are conditioned on. Conditioned on basically means they're fixed. I assume I know the values of them. Or in a position, they have converging arrows along that path, and the, their descendants, nor they, are not um, conditioned on. So from that confusing uh, expose, is A independent from D? What do you think? Ah, no questions. Uh, yes, they are. Um, because if you look at the two paths we have, so there are two possible ways how to connect A and D. So there might be two ways where the uh, dependence might sneak in. Small little thingy. So in the first case, uh, you might remember the blocker is the guy who is, has any convergent path or any convergent arrows coming in, so C, for example. And, but he has to be um, uh, conditioned on in case if he's being traversed in the right direction. And no, he's not. I'm just asking independently on A and D. Or, opposed to that, uh, the other path the A and D, again, if we go above, C again is still has a converging arrow and is still not conditioned on. So basically C is the main blocker now. He's the, the culprit. But actually, if you look, we have a second culprit on the first path. It's F. F is also having incoming arrows not being conditioned on. So basically, spoilery, if I add C, I condition, I ask, is A and D independent, assuming I know C? No. Because now C was opened up. He's not um, blocking the link between A and D because B wasn't blocking it at all previously. It was only C in the upper path. And so if I fix C, then they are not independent. So. What this, um, what this gives you, like he's showing us some DAGs and some conditionings and stuff like that. It gives you the idea that you have some relation between the big unwieldy table with uh, the conditional probabilities between all the variables and the uh, directed acyclic graph and the possibility of calculating any or relating any two variables in that graph. And that leads to and then teaching such, a, such a, an algorithm that if you have, uh, if you want to teach a Bayesian network, so you have three, there, there are multiple methods how to teach them. But um, in general, it's good to observe three um, conditions or assumptions which you would like to have in that Bayesian network. First, you want causal sufficiency. So 
there shouldn't be no hidden common causes. It, it, that could be, for example, um, uh, uh, if, if you work with the more general approach, like Markovian, where you could have hidden nodes, then in, in Biasin you don't want them. You don't want, in, in explaining how, why the audience is asking the questions, you want to show the variable of the audience is confused or clever. You want to have them there in your reasoning when you're determining why they're asking so many questions. Um, the causal Markov property also, that um, any variable is independent of all its non-descendants. So you want, if you have a variable, if we go back to the slide, I don't like going back, but yeah. So A should be independent of all the nodes which are not descending from A and which are, uh, or uh, not A, let's, um, yeah, C. If, if we take C, then C should be independent from, ah, there's no, ah, from D. C should be independent from D if I fix A and B under the condition of A and B. So if, if I take the outcome, the um, original variables, in this case A and B, and I fix them, I don't want C to have any effect on D. And the last, that's the, the relation between the joint probability distribution and the uh, DAG, the, the directed acyclic graph, that the joint probability distribution and the graph are faithful to each other. If you create a graph in such a way that it matches your huge table, then you can use those neat, smaller tables, better understandable and easier to, to deal with. Um, it, it, how this translates then basically to learning from data, the, what, what you would want to create from data would be this directed acyclic graph. And what you're basically then doing on data, uh, especially in the constrained approaches, is that you're doing statistical tests on those data. You take your data as the observations, and then you just try, what if I fix this guy, what happens to that guy, that variable, what, what happens between them? And you just do a lot of tests, just. Uh, there's a bunch of methods which uh, allow to do this, but with no further ado, we come to the demo part. So, um, that doesn't show there. Uh, -da. Demo. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yay. Uh, as uh, maybe the pandas is super loose for you, but there's a neat library in Python for that, the PGMPI. So, um, probability graphical models. It doesn't deal only with uh, uh, Bayesian models, it deals also with a bunch of other models. So if you want to go into that, I would only recommend. As a short rundown, uh, classical imports. Now, this is an example of just a few full um, run of the model or of the P, um, Python module. So as Usual, you get the data frame, you fit the model, and notice here, you're creating uh, the directed acyclic graph in this case. The assumption of how the, um, how the graph should look like. And then you fit the values, and then you can predict the data and do predictions. Um, they present the results in uh, their specific class of tabular CPDs and we can show more about them. But you can notice that for each, um, each of these CPDs is the local um, probability table only. So what you get are really neat and well interpretable tables. So in this case, we took the, uh, took the first one uh, for the variable A, and yeah, we get the probabilities for the binary variable of 54% uh, uh, being um, it uh, true and 46% being it false. Now, 
I promised some Kaggle data. Uh, sadly, I promised them before I saw them because they're quite bad. Uh, you might notice here on the first 10 entries, there's a lot of really rich data. Uh, I don't know how what's the student status called NAN. I guess that's like not actually nurtured or something like that. Uh, it's interesting that it correlates very strongly with the learning data science behavior of the students. And yeah. Um, but what I wanted to demonstrate isn't the Kaggle data set, which uh, I'm after looking at the data set, I'm more surprised what results they showed on the web page. Um, but just a short demonstration of how you can work with uh, um, probabilistic, uh, with Bayesian neural network, uh, bah, Bayesian networks uh, in Python without uh, necessarily uh, making them from scratch. So uh, this is the French gender, le gender. And um, so because the data obviously, as you see, are uh, strings, and um, yeah, calculating with strings uh, would be a pain. Mm -mm. So I uh, translated all the strings into French uh, using the label encoders of uh, Scikit. So uh, we get all the countries. I, I selected those obviously where we have at least some values or reasonable amount of values. So we're trying to learn a network with uh, genders, uh, countries, and the employment status. And so, um, it's a dirty code, so yeah. Um, what you do, uh, you take the model and present the Bayesian model with some uh, assumption how, how it should look like. So these are directed um, uh, links again. So here I'm supposing that gender and employment uh, uh, that gender in some way determines employment and country in some way also determines employment. Um, then I fit the model and I get, uh, these, this is the uh, probability for different employment statuses based on different genders. Uh, yes, we have there three genders because there's not available and then there's this guy. Uh, this guy. As far as I know, he's like there's only one in the whole data set of 16,000. Uh, so what you get and what you can neatly print out if you need to um, check the calculations is in this case a quite long uh, table because of all the countries we have there. But what's uh, really neat about this um, package also and basically also of uh, about the, the, the Bayesian approach uh, with networks is that you can then verify the ind uh, independencies between different uh, variables. So in this case, because of how we set up our model, uh, duh, uh, we get the two nodes as independent. So that's like a foolproof verification. And um, as the last straw of my torture with this, this horrible code, which I wrote like in the 20 minutes uh, Marek left me downstairs in the parallel police, um, is this experiment of trying to predict data. Yeah, that went well. Um, because, um, yeah, the data is not very good. Uh, even if you try to teach the Bayesian network in this case on, or there, the, maybe the better assumption is that maybe, but m uh, just maybe, gender and country do not determine your employment. Hmm. Maybe. Uh, but um, so this gave me a lot of NAN results because, yeah, there's a ton of NANs in it. And um, if someone would ask, that's a question I can even anticipate with my prior capabilities. Why didn't you just eliminate the NANDs and then use the remainder of the data set? Even if I limit it to these three columns, I get zero. Like I get 
a very small data set, but not enough to, to do any reasonable work. But in general, uh, the, these top 10 are really cool. They have only this guy giving NANDs for country. But then there's a really huge amount of NANDs down, downwards. So it doesn't really help in uh, teaching the, the employment status. Um, yeah, back to slides. Boink. So, um, if anyone would not be really scared away by this, but would have this tingle of, um, that might be interesting, don't worry, there's more advanced topics and really cool stuff you can do with Bayesian networks. Um, not just learn a lot of zeros as a prediction. Uh, because there are, um, there's a few papers, I, I cite all the papers and stuff in the references in the end, uh, dealing with actually like uh, doing this, uh, pimping the neural networks in petting, uh, in Bayesian networks, in putting a Bayesian network into a Bayesian network, so like, yay, the object-oriented Bayesian network approach is that. Or, um, because you might think, what if I get actually some kind of uh, temporally given data? Then what you'll have is the predicting part, which is the lower black part, and then you uh, relate causally, in this case uh, with the Bayesian network, those different um, time, um, different timed inputs you get from the variable. So the lighter one or the white one is the um, uh, oldest one which influences, we assume, the newer one which influences the newest one and the newest one influences what we see uh, in the actual experiment or in the world or uh, as a result. So, um, torture cut short. Uh, the key uh, points I would like you to remember uh, except for my performance, is um, that bias networks help to deal with if you have a lot of variables. If you end up with having like this really huge table, maybe try to put it into a network and look at, uh, look at it from that perspective. Then uh, they allow you to learn, although I haven't demonstrated that very well on the demo, they allow you to also learn these um, relations. You don't have to come up with the network yourself. You can take the data you have and then do these statistical tests. If anyone is interested in then the links uh, or the, the actual methods of teaching, I can send him the links or he can um, scavenge them from the references. And bias networks are cool is the third one I would like you to take away. So for the references, just a short rundown. Uh, uh, if someone is still um, questioning the relationships between frequentist and Bayesian and would want to have like a larger table, of the one I presented with more um, uh, science-y language, then I can recommend that first article, just ignore the pharmaceuticonomics thing. But it's a good, a pr a good uh, summary of comparing those frequentist and Bayesian approaches. Then what's uh, really nice is the learning Bayesian network uh, model structure from data, uh, a PhD thesis from the Carnegie Mellon University, and obviously the uh, basically founding uh, work, as far as I know, uh, Judea Pearl's causality. Um, I shouldn't have the first link, but if anyone still struggles with bias itself, uh, Yudkowsky has like a special article for that, but he actually links in the beginning right to that arbitral uh, teaching uh, page, because he says that's a lot better. I think they're both cool. And if anyone would want to check out the Kaggle survey, yeah, available. The it's uh, the 2018 is not yet obviously done, and the PGMPI is the um, is the library which you can use if you have any uh, if you use Python and would want to toy around with that. Thank you very much.